What we, what we plan to get out of this, and there's a series of four workshops starting today, um, is that uh, increase your, uh, your, your awareness of the, mo the model, uh, the impact it will have on your ability to compete in the future uh, in the federal market, and what steps you need to take that are necessary to achieve the certification, and the strategies for leveraging CMMC as is, as is known to gain a competitive edge. And, and in order to do that, uh, we've uh, enlisted the services of Ms. Angela Dingle from uh, Washington, D.C. Um, she um, is a certified in the governance of uh, enterprise information technology um, with over 20 years of experience in the information technology governance, uh, cybersecurity, critical uh, infrastructure protection, strategic planning, uh, leadership development management processes. Uh, Ms. Dingle has led successful execution of over $40 million in public and private sector engagements um, in, in this arena. And so uh, we're, we're fortunate to have her with us today where she's gonna share uh, uh, her knowledge and wisdom, uh, but not just do that, but it's, it's an interactive uh, activity that we're bringing to you. And so you'll get a chance to, to listen to her talk about uh, CMMC, but then also get to do some uh, real practical uh, work on uh, what that means based on what uh, has been shared. And um, at the end of it, uh, uh, if you have questions, what we want you to do is in the chat, put your questions in the chat. I got somebody monitoring that and uh, she'll be answering questions throughout. She doesn't want, uh, she was told, she told me she doesn't want us to hold until the end, especially since uh, I know you're scared it's about two hours, but trust me, it's not gonna probably feel like two hours by the time uh, we get through with this. Um, so um, without uh, further ado, what I'd like to do, Ms. Dingle's on the screen and I'm gonna turn it over to her so we can get started with the first of the four workshops. Uh, today, we're talking about understanding uh, the cyber security maturity uh, model certification. Angela. Good morning. Uh, actually, I guess it's afternoon. So thank you, Tommy, for that great introduction. I'm happy to be with you guys here uh, this afternoon to start this four part series. I'm going to be sharing my screen with some slides for you. We'll have some activities where you get to engage with me as I share content with you. And then we're gonna do a, uh, we're gonna do a breakout session so, that you have, so you have an opportunity to engage with one another. Uh, as I said, I'm happy to answer your questions as we go along. You don't have to wait until the end to share them with me. As long as you put them in the chat, we'll try and get to them as early as possible. So here's kind of what we're gonna to cover today, right? I'll be talking about what the cybersecurity maturity model certification is. You know, if we're talking government contracting, we're gonna be talking about acronyms, right? So CMMC is one of those additional acronyms that you're gonna to have to add to your cadre of things that you're keeping track of already. So we'll talk about what it is. I'm gonna to talk to you about how the CMMC is gonna affect your ability to compete. Um, and then we'll talk about the things that you need to do to get started. And like I said, you'll have an opportunity to participate in some polls that just give us a sense. Uh, the, the Federal Procurement Center is always trying to bring you the best uh, products and services that they can to help you to grow your business. And so the more we understand about where you are with respect to the cybersecurity maturity model and some of the things that you might need, uh, they will be uh, that much more informed and able to help you. So the polls will give us a sense of that. And then the case study, uh, I think that you'll find interesting because it'll give you a little bit of context of what this might look like uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with respect to your business. And then we'll wrap up and uh, you guys will have a handout that goes along with the case study. You'll have my contact information if you need to. And I'm certain that the NSCAR team over at the Federal Procurement Center will be more than happy to uh, help you with any questions that you have. All right, so let's get started here. So Jacob, can you pop up this first survey for this first poll for me? Um, and I'm asking this question because it'll give me a good sense of where you guys are. So how many of you currently have, you are a current DOD uh, contract holder, either a prime contractor, or if you are a subcontractor on a DOD contract. And for those of you that might not know that acronym, let me define that one, that's Department of Defense. And so for, for defense, um, I actually am being very inclusive there. So I mean, any of the four uh, military uh, components, right? So. Uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. And then if you've worked in the intelligence community, uh, they are DOD components as well. Okay, so um, let's see, we'll give it a couple more seconds. 
as I see a few folks still may need to answer that. All right. I'll give that a few minutes, I mean, a few seconds. <laughs> All right, Jacob, you want to uh, end the poll for me and show us the results? Thank you for doing that. So it looks like uh, the bulk of the folks that have joined us today don't have a DOD contract. And this will be a very inform as, as informative a session for you as it will be for the uh, two groups that do have a contract. So about 30% of you guys do. So. Um, the, that question is going to be important as we talk about some of the newest set of regulations that have come out about CMMC. And then for those of you that don't have a DOD contract currently, then that will um, help me to make sure that I cover some of the content that will be helpful to you today. Okay, you can um, stop sharing that poll for me, Jacob. Thank you. And I will go to my next slide. All right, so what is the cybersecurity maturity model? Again, uh, most often you're gonna hear people refer to it as the CMMC. It is a new verification method that the Department of Defense or DOD is gonna use to ensure that contractors are protecting unclassified information. And so this is a new twist, right? You notice I didn't say classified information. Um, there have been a number of significant data breaches that have occurred over the last couple of years that have really just kicked the U.S.'s butt, right? We've got adversaries who want to get access to our uh, military infrastructures and our technology so that they can compete with us a lot more effectively when it comes to, to fighting your traditional wars. But also there's a whole lot of uh, theft of intellectual property and technical designs that's happening both in the private sector and in the public sector. And if you think about the way that the federal government works in general, you know, the, the federal workforce uh, is, is not doing a lot of, um, it's not doing all of the work, right? They form these great partnerships with companies like yours and mine to help them to deliver uh, the products and services that they need to deliver to the American public and to protect the American public. And when you think about the Department of Defense, their primary mission is to, um, is to equip the warfighter, right? They want the warfighter to be protected and have anything that he or she might need in order to be able to uh, protect the United States from, uh, from adversaries. Um, there have, like I said, there have been a couple of these different uh, scenarios that have happened. And as a result, uh, Department of Defense has figured out it's not their classified systems that are being breached. Not that those haven't happened, that's happened as well. But for the most part, it's happening through the, uh, through their partners, through the companies, the commercial companies that they're doing business with, their systems are not secured. So they've created this, um, this category of information called con uh, controlled unclassified information. And this whole CMMC uh, certification is based on the concept that they want contractors to safeguard this unclassified information that may find its way into our system. So emails that we're sharing back and forth, PowerPoint slides, information about contracts that we may have in our system that you wouldn't normally think uh, may have any significance. But if, uh, for those of you that do have DOD contracts, if you've ever done any classified work, then you know that it's the aggregation of information that turns it into classified information. If I have a little bit of information about how we build a ship and a little bit about where we buy our parts from, those things, two things in and of themselves may not be classified, but if you combine them together, then if I'm an adversary, I can figure out how to disrupt your supply chain and maybe prohibit the United States from building the kind of ship that they need to build in order to fight me in a war. And so that's a really high level scenario, but that's really what this issue is about. So this cybersecurity maturity model certification has five levels of certification. And the levels of certification are based on the practices, best practices from a cybersecurity standpoint that you have in your business. And so they range from basic cybersecurity hygiene and so for those of you who don't have a DOD contract yet, you may very well have uh, a provision in your existing civilian contract that has this basic uh, cyber hygiene requirement in it to these advanced levels of protection. And so when we're talking advanced levels of protection, we're talking about um, more proactive cybersecurity fighting back, not only knowing that there are adversaries out there, 
but actively going and looking for them and trying to make them stop getting at your system. And so for small businesses that are doing business in the federal contracting space, you won't often have that type of, that level five requirement. Those are gonna be the larger integrators, right? The Boeing, um, you know, the companies that are building the latest and greatest new aircraft carrier or new uh, fighter jet pilot that we have or any kind of secret technology. I imagine that um, some of the things that's going on with the new space force will probably have that level five requirement. Right now, the word on the street is that if you, uh, for the most part, DOD contracts will be released with a level three requirement in them. But we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. If you are doing business with the Department of Defense, you will be required to meet this, this requirement. One of the common questions that I get is, oh, but I'm only a one or a two person company. Do I have to do it too? Yep. You do. The other question that I get is, well, I'm a subcontractor. Can't I just have my prime contractor pass their certification along to me? Nope. You got to have one for yourself. So each company that does business with the Department of Defense, with some exceptions, and I'll tell you what the exceptions are. So if you have, if you sell a COTS product, commercial office shelf product, like um, Microsoft Office 365, for instance, they don't have to achieve this certification because that software goes through a separate certification process in order to even be on a on a list that uh, the Department of Defense can buy from. It's called an approved products list. All right, so there are a number of different uh, processes that are associated with these certification levels. So remember I told you that there are five. Any of you guys that might be familiar with other maturity models like CMMI, which is the Capability Maturity Model Integrated, that's one that you see very common with professional services companies or companies that develop software. They may, you may have even seen it in a federal RFP. It might say you need CMMI level two or level three. Those are all maturity levels. And it, it is a measure of what types of processes that you have in place and how well you practice those. So for the CMMC certification, there are uh, practices at every level at level one, you just have to be able to demonstrate that you are performing those practices. At level two, it gets a little bit more interesting. You have to be able to determine, um, you have to be able to demonstrate that you've actually documented those practices. So at level one, I can say, oh, I am uh, protecting my computers against virus because I'm running antivirus software. At level two, you'd have to be able to produce a document that says, this is our procedure for making sure that we're running antivirus software. And then at level three, you have it at a much more uh, mature level. That's where it's managed, right? I've got a plan that says, this is our plan every year. We've got a policy that's associated with ensuring that everyone is following that plan. And we're doing some additional things so that it becomes institutionalized within uh, the company with respect to and I'll use that example, antivirus protection, right? At level four, you are reviewing those things. So I've got a best practice that's documented that I am managing. And now I'm going back and I'm checking, I'm inspecting what I expect, right? So if I expect that people are following that process, I am reviewing it level, at level four to make sure that they're doing that on a regular basis. And then at level five, and this is where we'll talk about in one of the other sessions during the CMMC, you want those processes to be optimized because you, once you get to the level of having optimized processes within your company, whether they're cybersecurity processes or otherwise, now you can create a competitive advantage because you can leverage that optimization to increase productivity or efficiency or outbeat your competition. And so we'll talk in one of the other cybersecurity workshops about how you're able to do that using the CMMC. Uh, you'll notice that there's a little note at the bottom and this, this, uh, this graphic that you see is a part of the CMMC model that was released by Department of Defense. So you have access to this information in the public domain. Um, you'll notice that it says planning activities there. At level three, in addition to simply documenting the processes, the thought process is that um, if, if you're managing something, you want management commitment. So there needs to be a policy that says, this is our management, this, this is our commitment as the ownership of the company to follow this particular process. And again, if you're familiar with ISO, you know, ISO 9000, which is the quality management system that has a management commitment as, as well. So they're similar in that nature. 
uh, CMMC goes one step further because then they're looking for plans, right? Do you have, is there, is there any evidence of the fact that you're actually thinking about how you're going to manage this and you have some plans associated with how you do that? So that's what that planning uh, asterisk is that you see down there. There are a number of best practices that are required. And this is where the type of contract that you have comes into play. So uh, the CMNC standard, um, the CMNC certification is a combination of some existing certification, uh, existing uh, cybersecurity practices already. And they were able to pull those things together by looking at the FAR and the DFAR. So for those of you that might be new, the FAR is the Federal Acquisition Regulation. Those are essentially the terms and conditions that are in any federal contract that you sign. And the DFARS is the Defense FAR or Federal Acquisition Supplement. So these are additional uh, FAR clauses that the Department of Defense adds on when you do business with them. For the most part, the CMMC requirement has been implemented under a DFARS requirement. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes but they were able to look at existing clauses that were in the FAR as well to help to build out this framework for the level. So at level one, that basic cyber hygiene that I told you about, that is governed by FAR clause uh, 52-204-21. Now, a lot of contractors don't understand that they may very well have that, con that uh, FAR clause in their contract already, which means that you should be practicing some basic uh, cybersecurity hygiene. So at level one, there are 17 practices that are defined in that FAR clause. And if you have a requirement in your contract from DOD to meet CMMC level one, those are the 17 practices that you would need to implement. And they range from, they're just basic things, right? If, you, if, you're, if you're familiar with any cyber hygiene, you know you need to be um, having strong passwords. You know you shouldn't be sharing them with anyone else. Every password should be unique to a person. Uh, there's some things that you need to be doing in terms of uh, configuration management so that you know when a problem exists, you know how to go find all of the pieces of technology that might be affected by that call, by that uh, problem. And so that's level one. Level two is an intermediate level of uh, cyber hygiene. So it's some additional practices, right? There are 72 additional practices. And those practices come from a standard, a cybersecurity regulation called NIST 800-171. And so let me kind of spell that out for you. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology, they're right up in uh, Germantown, Bakersburg, Maryland, for those of you that might live in the Washington metropolitan area. Uh, they release special publications that uh, kind of lay out what is necessary to meet a certain level of security for federal systems in general. There is an overarching one that is used to govern how federal information systems are, um, are secured. It is NIST Special Publication or NIST SP 800-53. Uh, NIST 800-171, which is the one that these 72 practices come from, it's a subset of that. So it's, there's about 14 of them that they've pulled out of that larger uh, set of practices and at level two, you'd have to comply with what you see at level one, so those 17 practices that are in that FAR clause, as well as the, these additional 72 practices that are defined in NIST Special Publication 800-171. And so, uh, so when you get to level three, then you've got to have what's called good cyber hygiene. There are 130 practices that have to be uh, implemented at that point. So your responsibilities under the levels with respect to the practices are cumulative. In order to meet level three, you have to have already satisfied the requirements at level one and at level two and so on. So 130 practices at level three, uh, they all are encompassed in uh, NIST 800-171 and it's 20 additional practices from what you had to do before. So I see a little bit of uh, things that are going on in the chat. I will make sure that there are no questions there for me. Um, there is one if you're ready, Ms. Dingle. Sure, I do see one. Does the construction industry benefit from this certificate? Are federal contracts requesting this now? Yes, that's a really good question. So I have had uh, 
folks that are in construction ask. Yes, so there are, there are no industries within Department of Defense that have been singled out to say that they don't have to comply with this, uh, with the exception of, like I said, the, the COT software. And it's because there was already an existing uh, um, uh, approval process for software anyway, that, that if you're selling to the Department of Defense from a software standpoint, then there's a process that they already had to go through. So construction companies do have to meet this certification. And so if you think about it, if you're doing construction uh, within Department of Defense is called MILCON, right? So military construction, you're getting access to our uh, defense bases, right? So you might know where the warehouse is, where we're storing some of our bullets or jackets for the, for the folks that are in the, the war fighters, depending on which military base that is, some bases, the entire base is a classified base, right? You have to have a certain level of clearance in order to be able to uh, step onto that property. So yes, construction companies are uh, required to meet this certification requirement as well. And I hope that answers your question. So now let's talk about level four. Level four is proactive, right? So remember I told you as, as the, uh, the processes in, increase, then it's less about uh, simply having good hygiene and being more proactive about the way that you approach cybersecurity. This is where that shows up in these practices, right? So in addition to the practices that are the 130 practices that are at 800-171, there's some additional practices in a supplement called 800-171B. And so there's some additional things that you have to do there to be a little bit more proactive about the way that you go about cybersecurity. For the most part at levels one, two, and three, you're kind of passively watching behind the scenes to see if something is going on. When you start getting to level four and level five, you're looking to see where the problems are first to see if you can head them off at the path or just be a lot more uh, advanced and progressive about the way that you're protecting your systems from a cybersecurity standpoint. So at level five, again, you've got to meet all the requirements for the lower levels. Uh, that's going to mean all of the practices that are in that FAR clause, all of the practices that are in 171 uh, revision one, all of the practices that are in 171B, and, uh, and all of those things have to be documented and you have to be able to provide evidence that you are doing those things. So when we think about what's required for certification, because I'm sure that's a question that you guys are asking, I'm hoping that this visual will give you a sense on the right-hand side, you can see these levels, right? So you have to have, at level one, you have to be able to perform these basic cyber hygiene practices. And at level two, you have to have documented these intermediate cyber uh, practices. And at level three, you have to be managing. So I won't go through that all, um, you know, each of those levels, but that's essentially what that means. And when I talk about practices and levels and all of those things, they are broken into what are called capability domains. If you are familiar with any federal information security regulations, like 800-53, or if you've looked at NIST 800-171 before, they were previously, probably the closest um, example that I can give you is these used to be called control families, right? So there is an, a, a family of control. So there are a number of different things that have to be done to satisfy the requirement for access control. And there are a number of things that have to be done to satisfy the requirements for incident response. Uh, under the CMMC program, there were two new uh, capability domains that were brought into this family of controls. One is recovery. So what happens after there's been a cybersecurity incident? How do you recover your systems and your personnel and potentially data if there's been any data that's lost? And situational awareness, right? How aware are you of what's going on uh, both within your company and in the world from a cybersecurity standpoint? So I am certain that you guys have seen and are uh, at least aware of, you might not be following it, especially if that's not what your day-to-day -day business does, but I'm certain that you've heard about the solar wind incident, right? So when you talk about situational awareness, that's an awareness of, of the fact that that's going on, what some of the threats may have been, and how that might be able to impact your business. So you'll get an opportunity to look at these, uh, look at these domains again when you are working on your case study. Within each of them, at level one, you may not even have a requirement for one. 
So um, let's say if we were to take um, um, audit and accountability, at level one, there may be no requirement for you to do auditing within your system because that's not really a basic cyber hygiene. Uh, access control is making sure that you know who's logging into a system and who's not. So the CMMC uh, maturity model has a, has a set of appendices that kind of walk you through what's required at each level and what's not. And as you prepare for the certification, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but as you prepare for it, you select the controls that are appropriate to the level that you're trying to achieve. And those are the things that you implement within your company when you're talking about CMMC. So uh, there are a couple of terms that you need to be aware of. So you heard me, might've heard me say some of them. So one is CUI, that's controlled unclassified information. Uh, at some point when all of this first started, it was called um, controlled technical information, controlled defense information. So if you look in your contract and you see any of them that are preceded by that controlled and combined with unclassified, that's generally what they're gonna be talking about. I'll show you where we are along the continuum with respect to uh, how advanced this process is and what DOD is doing to bring it all together. The other term that you should be aware of is FBI, that's federal contract information. So again, if you've worked on a classified contract before, you will know that the combination of like the name of a contract and the amount of money associated with that contract and who it's been awarded to, that combination together may be classified, right? Because if I know that it's Angela Dingle's company that's building the next, uh, the next uh, jet fighter, right? I might be trying to get access to Angela Dingle's systems in order to, to find out what that technology looks like. So federal contract information is a subset of CUI that needs to be protected under the CMMC program. And for the most part at level one, it's FBI that you're protecting. At level two and above, it's more CUI. Uh, C3PAL is a certifying body. So it is a, a third party um, certifying organization. When you apply for the CMMC certification, Department of Defense is not the one that issues it. You uh, implement the practices and processes within your company. You prepare a, what's called a system security plan or a package of information that goes to an assessor or a certifier and a third party will come in, do that inspection and uh, assessment, and then they are the ones that grant the uh, certification to you. And currently the certification lasts for a, the, the plan is for it to last for a three year period of time. And then the final term that you should know, and it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to a really technical person, you may hear them say the CAI triad. This really is confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Those are the three kinds of ways that information needs to be protected. It either needs to be protected from a confidentiality standpoint, meaning making sure only the people who have a need to know get access to it. It needs to be protected from an availability standpoint, meaning if I have a need to know and I am looking to use that data to make a decision, it is ready and available when it should be. And the third component is integrity. That's giving me the assurance that I have the need to know I can get to the data because it's available and I know that it's not been tampered with in a way so that the information is no longer valid. So that's the CAI triad. And I'll stop and see if there are any more questions there before we go forward. All right, so plan, for planning and budgeting, what is the typical cost to be CMMC certified at level one and level three? Jacob, that's a great question. So uh, it's very early in the process. If you listen to uh, the Department of Defense, currently the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer for Department of Defense is Ms. Katie Arrington. Katie has been doing a roadshow on the CMNC program for about two to three years. She's done a great job of making sure that industry is informed about the fact that this is the direction that uh, DOD is going in. And even as the pandemic started, people were saying, oh, you know, it's not going to happen anymore. And she's going, yeah, it's happening. And I want you to pay attention. She is giving an estimate of about $3,000 for the certification. So the certification is what the, the uh, C3PAL does. 
the uh, the work that might need to, need to be done to to implement those requirements can be a lot more expensive, right? So we're seeing estimates for small companies in the fifteen to twenty five thousand dollars, and it can be in the hundred thousand dollars for large companies who have not implemented a formal program yet. So it can be it can get a little bit expensive as you start to work on um, your certification. So I think that was the only question that I saw. Jason, can you, um, uh, Jason, Jacob, can you pop up my second poll for me, please? And while he's working on that, I'll check and see if there were any other questions there. So there was one additional question, Ms. Gable. Do all levels, even zero and one, have to be externally audited? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this next section that we're going to go into, I'll explain to you why that's the case. So there is no level zero with CMMC. It starts at level one, and you have to have a third-party certification for all five levels. So Jacob, how are we doing on the survey, on the poll there, the second one? All right, well, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that second poll. Uh, so now let's talk about um, how it affects your ability to compete. So although when I introduced CMMC, I said it was a new program, the certification is what's new. The government's decision to uh, ask uh, their partners, contractors, to protect unclassified information is not new. It's been around for a number of years. And that question that you asked a few minutes ago about whether or not you have to have a third party, I'll answer it for you here. So some years ago under the Obama administration, um, the White House issued an executive order that essentially gave Department of Defense the authority to ask contractors to safeguard this unclassified information that ends up in our systems, right? If you think about when you work with a customer, whether it's a government customer or not, you know, you exchange information so much. And for the most part, if we're exchanging that on the unclassified email, you make the assumption that it's unclassified and there's no, you know, nothing else to really think about it. But I can remember having worked on programs where we were doing, you know, we were, we were uh, doing the graphical design for a technical system and we're just passing that back and forth through e email. Well, well, at some point that became a classified system. And so, uh, you know, over time the government realized that that's what's sitting in our, uh, in our company system. So this executive order essentially uh, moves that forward. And out of that came these two, uh, came this DFARS clause. So 252.204-7012. So you may hear people say, um, I have 7012 in my contract or I have the CUI, um, uh, requirement in my contract, you may hear them say, I've got safeguarding in my contract, or your contracting officer may say something about safeguarding. So uh, if you take nothing else away from this today, if you see the word safeguarding in any of your existing contracts, start paying attention because it may be one of these two clauses that exist already, or another one that's similar. So DOD has been driving this, but other federal agencies see the need for it as well, because it's not just defense information that is uh, sensitive, right? Think about the Department of Energy. If I am working with the Department of Energy, they do nuclear regulatory work. If I'm working with the um, with one of the utilities, I might be able to find out information about, uh, about our power sources. It's just a number of different ways that this aggregation of information can go from just being, you know, plain old unclassified information to something that could be used to cause harm and or to steal intellectual property. So the FAR clause that I mentioned is, is 52.204-21. Those are basic safeguarding requirements. Those of that FAR clause appears in both civilian contracts. So for that 70% of you guys that said you don't have a Department of Defense contract currently, um, that FAR clause may be in your contract already. And then the DFARS clause is going to be in any of the contracts that are have been issued by the Department of Defense and or agencies that are in the intelligence community. And I think I saw a question about DHS. So DHS is currently not considered a part of DOD. It is a civilian agency, but DOD is the civilian uh, counterpart to what you see happening in the Department of Defense. So 
uh, you will see them mirror a lot of these types of security provisions in their contracts. So they've got a, they have a uh, different set of regulations that's based on the over, that overarching federal one that I was telling you about. So, so we can talk about that a little bit more as well. So let's see, I see from uh, Jacob, if, you're, if a company feels they're ready for certification, is it required of them that a company help in the preparation? No, you don't have to, you don't have to hire a company to help you prepare. You do have to hire the third party to do the certification. And it is a it is a yes or no, right? It's a pass or fail. So if your contract says you have to be assessed at level three and you the the certifying body comes in and you don't meet the requirements for level three, you're not level two, you're not level three, you're just not certified. So I hope that makes sense. So um, so a lot of times we just talk to people about, you know, if you understand the regulation and you know how to satisfy, then go for it. If you don't, you'll want to get some help because this is, uh, we see a lot of people using commercial practices to try to satisfy these federal requirements and they're, they're not the same. So you want to make sure you pay attention to that. All right, so, so they, there are these two existing uh, uh, FAR and DFAR clauses that were added to people's contracts. And those FAR, the DFARS clause essentially says, hey, you need to implement the this, this 110 controls that are defined in this special publication 800-171. And uh, it just kind of said that. And so years go on, there are more, more of these breaches. You know, the Department of Navy released a cybersecurity um, report that said 600 billion with a B dollars of intellectual property and technology are being stolen through this type of um, this type of incident, right? So, um, so that wasn't working. So in uh, 2016, the Department of Defense kind of upped the ante and they said, hey, if you have this DFAR clause in your contract, then you have until December 31st of 2017 to tell us whether or not it's been implemented. You're supposed to contact the the chief information officer for the Department of Defense and let us know whether or not you've implemented. I wish I had this poll to ask you because how many of you think that, um, how many of you think that people told that they didn't implement it? I can tell you that a significant number of companies didn't admit that it had not been implemented. So what keeps happening? There are still continued and ongoing breaches, right? So that's what uh, led to the cybersecurity and maturity model certification. NIST 800-171 is what's called a self-adaptation. You have the ability to, uh, to attest as to whether or not you implemented it. I'm not sure why that poll just went there. There we go. I must have been moving my screen around a little bit to uh, check on those, on those uh, chat questions. So under NIST 800-171, you self-attest. You kind of say, hey, yes, I've implemented it fully, or no, I haven't. And as I said, a significant number of, of DOD contractors simply didn't say anything. So uh, for an optimistic uh, DOD person that gave them a false sense of security that the unclassified information that's in our systems was a whole lot more secure than it was. And for the people that are making the decisions about CMMC and looking at which uh, threats are out there, they knew that it, it uh, left the uh, defense industrial base, which are the 300 or so companies that do business with the Department of Defense, left them in a vulnerable state. So the CMMC uh, moves away from the self-attestation to a third-party certification. So you no longer get to, to do a self-attestation under the CMMC program. You have to have a third party to come in. So it's really trust but verify, right? Yeah, we trust you that you said you implemented it, but we want to see it and we want a third party to tell us whether or not that's been done. And I can see another question up there. Let me see if I can answer that for you before I go to the next slide. All right, so is there a process to become a third party certification body? Yes, there is. And that's one of the sessions that we're gonna do in this workshop. I'm gonna to talk to you guys about how you can take this requirement that all, you know, um, let me even just stop. I caught myself trying to answer two questions at one time, right? Uh, I'll talk to you about how you can uh, become a third party certifying body and or become a trainer with this, be an assessor. There's all these great uh, business opportunities that come out of that if that's something that you want to pursue. And then the second question that I see 
is what's the process to become a third party, to become th certified. Yeah, um, it's too much for me to cover, Dana, in this particular session, but I, we do have one of the sections in this four-part series that's centered around that, and I'll provide you all the information and tell you how to go there. Um, there's a cost associated with it, right? So um, it, it's in the $5,000 range to become uh, a part of that DOD certification ecosystem, but, you know, depending on where your business is and what it is that you're trying to accomplish, it might be a great uh, financial investment for you, and that's a business decision that you'll want to make about whether or not you invest the dollars in order to do that. So I'll just give you the information that you need to uh, to make an informed decision about that. But it is a process. So you essentially register and they do a background investigation on you. They do a background investigation on the company. You have to have a certain number of individuals that have credentials that are certified that are in the ecosystem as well. So there's a little bit of cost and some time. Uh, they started that process last year and the time frame for that was about eight months. Um, it's still ongoing, so there there are people who have been designated provisional, but no one has nobody has been through the the whole um, shebang yet. So we'll continue to watch that. Uh, I I almost answered two questions because this process started in Department of Defense, and I'll show you. Uh, uh, I'm going to show you a slide in a couple minutes, not this one. It started in DOD, and they've got a timeline for when they were going to roll all of this out. Well, other agencies jumped on as well because they see the value in it. And so it's important, and that's why I asked the question about whether you have federal contracts or DOD contracts, because ultimately it will affect uh, everyone that's doing business in the, in the federal marketplace. And I'll show you some examples of what that looks like as we go a little bit farther. So I, I added this slide because I don't think that um, I don't think that small businesses in particular understand how vulnerable they are. The Department of Defense knows that adversaries are trying to get. So first of all, they're after us in the United States as a whole, right? Think about what happens to you in your personal life in terms of social media or uh, just any of the systems that you use. So I was. Um, I was born in Ohio, but my dad was in the in the military, and he ended up retiring from the Pentagon Department of Defense. So since I was a wee little one, uh, the government has known all of the information about me. I've held a security clearance. My company has held one. My sisters, my brothers. I was in the opium breach. I was in the IBM. I made mean the uh, the IRS breach. I've been in the Yahoo and the you name the breach. I've been in it, right? And again, that combination of information makes us all vulnerable in our personal lives. But think about that from your business standpoint. There are a number of reports. I don't intend to uh, to go into detail on them in this session, but there are a number of reports that are produced every year about the nature and the cost associated with data breaches that as business owners or leaders within your organization, you should subscribe to them. They're free to the general public. You, they're released every year. And they really tell you like all the tricks of the trade that the bad guys are using to try to get to you. So the, the criminals, the hackers, they're targeting your businesses. And you don't have to believe me, there's a site that you can sign up for um, through Department of Homeland Security called CISA. It's the Cybersecurity and Infra Infrastructure Security Agency. That was a tongue twister and another acronym for you. Uh, CISA releases reports on a daily basis. Remember, I talked about situational awareness from a uh, CMMC standpoint to help you to get a sense of what's really happening with the bad guys. And they target individuals and companies that are unprepared because it's easy. It's easy money. It's easy to get your information and sell it. It's easy to, to take you uh, out of commission and keep you from being able to accomplish what it is that you want to accomplish. Let me check on the chat here because I see a couple of things there. All right. Uh, the question on the recording is a, uh, a federal procurement center question. So I'll leave that to you guys to answer. How does one become an independent third party auditor for CMMC? Lex, that's the question that Dana was asking. We'll cover that in another session, but there's a whole process that you have to go through. You have to apply, you have to apply, you have to pay a fee. They do some background investigations and other things like that. And then and then you go you go through a process and essentially you get a license. You get a one-year license to become a third party uh, certifier. So Sandra has a question. Will the government provide any financial assistance to small businesses to pay for the third party assessment? As of today, the government is not providing any assistance for that. However, 
some of the states are. I know the state of Maryland has a, uh, a CMMC assistance program. So if you're in the state of Maryland, you may want to check with your local FDA office to see if they know who that, um, who that um, entity may be in the state. Uh, my contact information will be available to you guys. I know I have it in my email somewhere and I can pass that one along to you if you need some assistance for that. Is there a website available with a list of companies that can assist small businesses with becoming CMNC certified at level one or level three? So yes, DOD is in the process of building what's called their CMNC marketplace. Uh, currently, all of the companies only have a provisional authority to do that for you. So no one has been finally approved, but there are hundreds of companies available in the, uh, in the marketplace right now. And what that means is they've paid the fee doesn't necessarily mean they've been through the background investigation, doesn't mean that they have, um, you know, passed all of the checks, it just means that they've paid the fee at this point. So you can certainly go on to the, um, go on to the CMMC AB and you can find that. All right, so let's have the third survey, if you can, for me. Jacob. Uh, that's our first one. Okay, this is a great one. You guys want to answer this one for me? So we talked a little bit about what kind of businesses might have to uh, to do the CMM certification. And while you're answering that one, I'll kind of relate it back to the um, the slide that I just showed you about the way that criminals target. So the thing that's important to understand about cybersecurity as a whole and CMMC is that the threats that your business face, they're unique to the industry that you're in. The type of approach that a hacker may take to, um, to hack a company that's in healthcare and the things that they're looking for when they do that are gonna be different than what they're looking for if they're going after a professional services firm. So we've got uh, about 70% of the people have responded. We'll let that go right to a minute and then we'll close that poll. So I see a lot of you all are in professional services and actually um, this next set of slides that we're talking about will be helpful to you. Thank you for sharing those. Yeah, so we got a couple of folks that are having COTS products. So those of you that have the COTS products, you'll have to go through either uh, fed ramp or you'll have to go through what's just called an APL in some of the defense agencies. Uh, it's a part of their DOD 5000, their acquisition strategy to get your COTS products approved. And then if you're in manufacturing or anything else, you'll have to go through this, um, this CMMC certification process. So thank you for sharing that poll for me, Jacob. All right, so we talked about, um, we talked a little bit about the fact that the, the criminals are always targeting the unprepared. And it's data that they want because that's how they make their money, right? If they can get, if you stop and think about it, even if you're a one-person company, if I can get access to your um, to your computer systems and lock your computer systems with a malware attack or a ransomware attack, if you make your money by providing professional services and you need your computer in order to do that, if I can lock your computer up and get you to pay me a million dollars in Bitcoin, and believe me, I see it happen on a regular basis, um, then that's how they make their money. And they get it in and they get out really quickly. And it's these types of, of things that are happening that uh, DOD is trying to, uh, trying to, to mitigate. So I've got two slides here. On the left-hand side, this is the nature of where the breaches are coming from. So you can see about 80% of them, this Verizon data breach investigation report is one that comes out every year. You can subscribe to it and it has uh, graphics like this. In addition to all the geeky text, it has uh, graphics that help you to understand in layman's terms, what types of threats you're up against. It is uh, data that is available for the US, 
globally within certain industries, right? So this is um, this is broad data here. About 80% of the uh, breach, breaches that happened in 2019 happened because from an external source, right? That meant a bad guy was trying to get in. Uh, internal breaches are insider threats. That means you or one of your employees or one of your contractors or one of your kids did something internally, and maybe even by mistake, but it caused a breach, right? And then if you're familiar with the Target breach from some years ago, that was a partner, right? Target's uh, HVAC contractor had not had their uh, account secured and the hacker was able to get in that way. What you see on the right-hand side is the motivation. So 70, 80% of the time, the bad guys are financially motivated. motivated. So if it's something like uh, a, a ransomware attack, I want my money, I get in, I get out. If it is a broader uh, nationwide state, if we can develop, if we can steal intellectual property from you or the United States and develop it quicker, then we make more money than you do faster than you do. And then there's still, still folks that are doing things in terms of espionage and other forms of ways that they're trying to get at data. So those things, those things are important for you to think about when you think about your business, right? And DOD is looking at and seeing this type of data and knowing that it has an impact on what people are doing in their systems, right? So uh, like I said, this has been going on for some time, right? So we talked about the executive order and the change to the FAR and the DFAR and the NIST controls and now CMMC. So CMMC was formally released in January of, uh, of last year. So January 31st, they released version one of the model. And the projection at that time was that they were gonna start adding CMMC to RFQs in the second quarter of last fiscal year, right? So, you know, um, March, June timeframe. And then in the, um, you know, the latter half of the year, they would start making changes to DOD 5000. That's their acquisition system, right? So how do their contracting officers buy whatever it is they need to buy in fiscal year 21. So right about now, you start seeing it in RFPs and RFQs. And then from now until 2026, which is when they are estimating that all of the 300,000 companies that are in the DIB, the defense industrial base. So those are the 300,000 companies that currently have a contract with DOD. Uh, it's gonna take them that long to get them all certified and get all the changes in place. So now this was the plan. So let me tell you what really happened. When we got to second quarter last year, before DOD could release CMMC into a uh, contract that everybody could see, because they did put it into several classified contracts. GSA for the General Service Administration for the 8A Stars 3 uh, recompete, they put CMMC in that requirement. So all kinds of companies were scrambling trying to figure out what to do. Uh, so other federal agencies, in particular GSA, and if you think about it, right, they're a huge buyer for the federal marketplace, but they're buying for civilian agencies, right? If they have jumped on board with this and started moving it forward, it will eventually spread across uh, the federal government as a whole. So right now, it has it is both on the civilian side and on the uh, DOD side. The other procurement that's coming up that you need to be aware of is Polaris, right? So Polaris is the um, is the replacement for Alliance Small Business. You know they couldn't release that under the Alliance program anymore. So Polaris is coming out. Great thing is going to have some women-owned small business tracks in there, but that will have the 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 word is that it will have the CMMC requirement in there. So now you're talking two civilian contracts that will have that requirement. And so if you think about, uh, are you, uh, I, can't, I can't see all of you guys, but you might be familiar with another uh, change that happened in the federal space over the last couple of years, right? So, you know, we've been having this back and forth thing with China about what kind of technology we're using and the federal government made a decision that there are five companies that you cannot buy technology from that you're going to use in support of a government contract. And so the, the FAR clause that went along with that supply chain requirement, the FAR clause in these two procurements that I'm talking about was in there as a placeholder. And in the middle of the procurement, Congress, or and I can't remember what the process, I think the FAR Council moved them forward and they became active while the solicitation was on the street. So with respect to CMMC, uh, I, I know it's a lot, but it's happening quickly. So you, so you need to kind of um, start paying attention 
because it takes some time to respond. You know, if you're at a basic level and you've got a you know general sense of what cybersecurity is, you might be able to implement those 17, but you're not going to get to CNMC level three next week, next month. It's going to take you some time to get there. And so you want to make sure that you're prepared for that. And I'll stop and see if there are any questions before I go on. Do you have to be a current DOD contractor to be a third party assessor for CMMC? No, you don't have to be a contractor. Uh, there are all manner of companies that have applied to uh, get those licenses because they know that that's going to be a cash cow for the rest of, uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, I see a question. Let's see if there's another question. Yeah, Jacob, I can't answer your question about the recording, so I'll let uh, I'll let Tommy's team answer that question for you. Okay. All right. So so it's happening right now. Uh, since this timeline was developed, which was about a year ago, DoD made another change. And now they really, uh, the, the rubber is hitting the road. So effective uh, November 30th, DOD implemented what's called an interim rule. An interim rule uh, is approval from OMB to change the FAR and the DFAR, right? So they, they uh, did some research on NIST 800 implementation and they figured out exactly what percentage of companies uh, had not implemented the NIST 800 provision. So they went back and they said, listen, we've been asking companies to do this for a number of years. None of them have gotten it done. We want some enforcement behind this requirement to implement NIST 800-171. So the first DFARS clause that was, the, the newest DFARS clause that was created associated with this program is DFARS 252.204-7019. It is a requirement if you would like, if you are uh, competing for a contract, you have to have implemented, uh, assessed your compliance with NIST 800 171 and enter. Uh, they've got a scoring methodology. You have to enter that score into a new portion, new part of the procurement uh, integrity environment. So if you've ever used wide area, wide area workflow, you know that system that you log in for there, that's where you're gonna record these scores. So you have to assess your system, figure out what the score is, and you have to put the score into this uh, supplier performance risk uh, system is what the SPRS stands for. And you have to have a system security plan. So system security plan is one of the requirements of NIST 800 171 anyway. Uh, they're just saying you have to tell us whether or not you've done it so that we can hold you accountable for it because before you were able to you only had to tell them if you hadn't done it now they're saying you have to tell us you know how how effectively you have implemented it and uh, this caused a whole lot of panic right before the end of the year last year and some people chose to ignore it before the end of the year last year and i can tell you the contracting officers picked up the phone the first week of january and said hey you didn't do it and we're not going to award your option year unless you take care of it. So be mindful of that if you have an existing uh, contract. The information that you put into that, that score that you put into that system has to be kept current over a three year period of time, right? So if, you, uh, if there are no changes to your security program, the thought process is that every two years you will update that. Um, if you notice, I'm talking about NIST 800-171 and not CMMC, right? It's a, uh, there is a continuum that, that DOD has to go through to get people from where they are currently, which is the 800-171 requirement to where they need to be with CMMC. And so it's gonna take some years to get there and they're covering both bases. So for a company like ours who has a DOD contract, we have to do both. We have to manage and implement the 800-1 uh, requirements and report our score there. But we also have to do everything that we need to do to prepare for CMMC because we've got both of the requirements that are happening at the same time. And so some of you may find yourself in that situation as well. The next D4 clause that they implemented is for existing contract holders, right? So that first one is if you're getting ready to get an award for a DOD contract, we want you to have implemented NIST 800-171. 
The second one is for existing contract holders. So if you have an existing contract with that DFAR clause in there, you already had a requirement to um, make sure that you were flowing down that clause to your subcontractor. Why do you think they put that in a new DFARS clause? Because people weren't doing that either, right? I can't tell you how many companies that I talk to uh, who don't understand that they have a security requirement in their contract, either because their prime contractor didn't tell them or they didn't understand what those FAR clauses mean. And if you've seen federal contracts before, you know, their section, I, it has all these clauses in there, and some people never go and look to see what those clauses are. So it's certainly understandable that someone would not understand that. But uh, under 7020, not only do you have to uh, put your score into the system, you have to include this provision in all of your subcontracts, and then you have to do something to confirm whether or not your subcontractors are in compliance. So for those of you that have it already, that's getting some kind of notification or indication. And, and there aren't really, really any rules about how you do that, except you have to be able to prove it, right? So um, you know, you may want to ask them to see what their score is or some confirmation from them that they submitted their score into the system. And then finally, between now and 2025 is when you will have to have the CMMC certification. It will be required for every DOD contractor by October 1st of 2025. But from now until then, uh, as new contracts come up, they're just adding the requirement in there. And so your certification will have to be maintained throughout the contract duration. So that means if you got a, you know, a base in four years or a 10 year, like some of these larger contracts, like um, 8A stars, that's a 10 year base and a three year option. So for those 13 years, you'd have to make sure that your CMMC certification was being maintained. And you've got to make sure that you're putting the flow down clauses into your subcontract. And in this instance, you have to get the certification from the subcontractor, right? So once you call in a third-party certifier, they're gonna give you a certification. So there'll be a number associated with that certification and an actual certificate. Uh, I imagine, they haven't said it, but I imagine DOD will probably require those certifications to be uploaded into that database as opposed to moving a whole lot of paper around. Uh, so you'd, you would then be required to get that same thing from your subcontractors to prove that they've actually um, implemented CMMC, and you'll have to do that prior to awarding them a subcontract. And that'll be a change because things move pretty fast, especially when you're talking about small businesses that want to team up and go after a great opportunity and be able to provide services. I'm going to stop for a second and check the chat and see where we are with that. Um, all right, so I see a guest that says, can home-based businesses become CMMC certified? So if you're registered in SAM with your um, with your small business, then you will have the same requirement. If they are accepting your home-based business uh, as a viable company to do business with, with DOD, then you'll have to meet the same requirement. So, um, so yes, a home-based business, as long as you've been approved to do business with the federal government would, would have to meet this requirement. I hope that answers your question. All right, so let's talk about some of the things that you can do to get started, right? It's important to know your responsibilities and you know your responsibilities by understanding those contract clauses that are there. For CMMC, for everything CMMC, and even now with NIST 800 and basic safeguarding, your responsibilities are outlined in your contract. So you need to look in your contract to see what FAR and DFAR clauses are in there. And then you'll have to implement all those different security controls that we talked about uh, on a regular basis. Once a year or so, you'll want to assess your risk. So what is the likelihood that I either have not implemented all of the controls or that one of the controls might fail? Uh, once you've done that, you'll request a third-party assessment, and then you'll have to maintain the certification in order to maintain your contract award. So we talked a little bit about, um, about key terms, right? So I talked about FCI, Federal Contract Information, and CUI, Controlled Unclassified Information. And I, and I made a distinction here, right? So an FCL is a facility clearance. We are not talking about classified information. So even if you stood up a set of processes for a classified information system that you may be running in your office, you can take those as a starting point to apply on the unclassified side, but they are not one and the same. So you'll need to make sure that you stand up and build a program around protecting a, a CUI or a QE, as I heard of. DOD person say the other day. It is going to apply to your teaming partners and your first tier subcontractors. 
it's going to apply to your service providers depending on what they do. So I've got a very good friend who does proposal management services. Well, a lot of the proposals that she does are classified proposals. Well, that's federal contract information, right? So she's got to implement some of these basic requirements as well. And ultimately, the Department of Defense will give some guidance on how you flow those clauses down. So anyone that's in your, um, in your federal supply chain, you'll want to think about Excuse me, you'll want to think about your responsibilities. <clears throat> with respect to <clears throat> how you get prepared. All right, last survey and then we'll uh, get ready to work on a case study. So Jacob can you get that one up for me. Uh, no, nope, the last one. Yep, this is a good question. So how many of you guys have a system security plan in place currently? And it's okay if you don't know or you don't have one. <clears throat> yeah, I'm seeing a good number of you guys that do. Good, good. And we'll leave that up for a couple more seconds to get give everybody an opportunity to respond. Okay, Jacob, you can close that poll and show us the results. Alrighty. So, yeah, so about uh, a third of you guys, a fourth of you all do have a documented system security plan, and some of you all don't know. Yeah, that'll be a learning curve for you, right? Not everybody knows what that is, um, and, and that's okay. A system security plan is one of the, that is, um, the one of the primary requirements associated with NIST 800-171. It essentially is the, the, the rule book for your, for your system security, how you are securing all of your information system. And those 17 domains that I talked about, those domains and the associated processes and policies and procedures associated with them are documented in your system security plan. So thank you, you can take that down that poll for me. Yeah, so I asked that question because <clears throat> the CMMC is this combination of a variety of different security breath practices that you might be aware of already. So some small business may, may have implemented the uh, Center for Internet Security Controls, right? There's about 20 of them. Those are incorporated into CMMC. The Cybersecurity Framework, which is the NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology, broad framework for uh, cybersecurity where they're getting, you know, they're just trying to get some common language across all of these frameworks. So when people talk cyber, they're all speaking the same language. I already talked about NIST 800-171 and 853. And then the ISO International Standard and GDPR, all of those concepts were um, brought into play to, to ensure that if you're implementing security controls, you're touching all of them. And if you've made some progress with GDPR, for instance, you don't have to start over from scratch in order to implement uh, the requirements under the CMMC program. All right, uh, one last survey. Let me pop that one up for me, Jason. Jacob. This one should be the one about uh, network computers. So while you're getting that up, I will check on the chat. Thank you, Janice. I see your comment. Great to be with you this afternoon. All right, here we go. All right, so what kind of business do you have? Yeah, this will be important because I know one of you had a question about a home-based business. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so one question that I get while you guys are working on that uh, has to do with this, right? If I'm working from home or if I'm working remotely or I don't have a file server, any of those things, am I, uh, do I still have to meet these CMMC requirements and how do I do that? Uh, we'll go to uh, 50 seconds, Jacob, and then you can um, 
you know, you can stop it. We want to make sure I give them some time to go into this breakout room. Perfect. Right. So a lot of you are using Wi-Fi and VPN, and we'll talk about that because your um, the things that you have to do for CMMC will require you to mature that process a little bit. You can take down this survey for me. Thank you. Yeah. So you guys can see a, a significant percentage of the folks that are here today are using either Wi-Fi and a VPN or something of that sort. So the, the, the type of controls that have to be implemented really have to do with the way that your environment is configured. So if you are, um, if you are in uh, using Microsoft 365 um, uh, commercial licenses, you're in what's called a commingled data center. And as you get to the higher levels of CMMC, the, the federal government will want their data segregated. Uh, and even though it's a little bit more costly up front, in the end, it ends up being, uh, scale, allows you to be scalable, it simplifies your cost, and you can get some competitive advantages about moving to those higher levels of uh, security controls. So uh, the final step that you have to do after you've implemented all of those things is to request a assessment, right? You request the third party. So self-assessment, remember that is, um, that's NIST 800-171. You can do that yourself. You are not required to do a self-assessment. Well, you are required to do a self-assessment, but you're not required to pay for a self-assessment prior to asking a third-party certifier to come in. You can hire someone to do that third-party and an independent third-party assessment with you if you don't feel like you have the expertise or you just want to have an extra check to make sure that you have satisfied all the requirements. But that third-party uh, fee-based certification is going to be mandatory in order to meet the CMMC requirements. All right, so let's kind of recap, and then we're going to go into our breakout rooms, right? So you want to start acting on this now. Make sure that you're treating it as a business priority because the regulations are moving fairly quickly, and the other federal agencies have um, looked at this. They see it as a good business decision, and they, too, are looking at changing their acquisition methods so that they can uh, take advantage of the security that comes along with CMMC. So you'll want to make sure that you're coordinating with your uh, your prime contractors or your contracting officers to ensure that uh, they're keeping you informed about the direction that they're going and you're keeping them informed about what you've implemented. Have a conversation with your subcontractors and your suppliers. Make them aware that this is coming along. If you have it currently in your contract, make sure that you float it down and are getting the requested information that you need from them so that they can be compliant as well. And if you don't have the expertise, make sure that you get some help, okay? All right, so let's work on our case study. Uh, I am gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. And um, each of you should have received a worksheet. That worksheet has some instructions. It is a real case study that is an actual um, uh, business owner here in the district that we've done business with. Uh, the case study has a um, scenario for you to read and then some questions, you will be automatically placed into breakout rooms and you've got 20 minutes to uh, work on that case study. So I'll stop and see if there are questions before you get into your breakout room. Yep, it's available in the chat so you can download that. And Sandra, if you have a question, I'll answer your question before we, um, before we break. Uh, we work from a network office as well as remotely for using home Wi-Fi. What are the implications to that? Yep, you have to secure both of those environments under CMMC. And so we can talk a little bit more specifics during um, during our next session. But yes, you'll have to you'll you will have to secure them both how people work in the office as well as at home. So uh, Jacob and the other team, the rest of the team, I'm I'm ready for the breakouts. If you all are, we can get folks into those rooms and give them 20 minutes, and then I'll see you guys back here soon. I am a Delta. <laughs> Thank you. I only see uh, guest five, but yes, I am guest five. Hi, Sora. <laughs> All righty, we ready? There we go.
Hello, and welcome back. Hopefully you guys had a opportunity to uh, have a good group discussion about that case study. So I'm gonna debrief you on that. So let's talk a little bit. I'm gonna switch and just say questions here. Uh, so if you followed the instructions, then you ought to have a spokesperson for each of the groups. So who's the spokesperson for the first, actually, I wanna know which breakout rooms you were in. <laughs> Um, can we do a show of hands and then I'll pick from the participants Joyce, if you can. Maybe you can hear now. Say it again. So if you'd like to share your thoughts from the breakout room, if you can raise your hand, you oh, can well, raise your hand. I don't think these are going to work. By clicking. No, um, it's mine. Oh. Oh. Hey. Jacob, can we mute everyone that is not uh, me? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for them. Okay, thank there you. There we go. Perfect, thanks. All right, anyone uh, would like to share from the breakout room? I see somebody I can pick on, but I'm gonna be nice because she wouldn't want me to call her name since we know each other. I'm gonna, I'll tell you who I'll talk to. I ended up in a breakout room with a group. So I'm gonna ask Sandra. Do you mind unmuting yourself and um, sharing your thoughts on what happened in that breakout session? Oh, okay. I see Leticia Smith is the uh, spokesperson for group four. So Leticia, if you're ready, you can unmute yourself. And uh, we'll have um, Jacob to unmute you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Leticia Smith with TUC Trucking. Uh, in my group, we discussed the situation with uh, Sarah um, and the, the partners over at ABC Partners. Uh, we felt Sarah was wrong for not processing it correctly through the process, the correct channels, um, if that's correct. Um, we felt that the correct processes, um, it should have been sent over to the department that handles payments or accountability um, as far as payments are concerned. And that it, I'll, we also suggest that the first initial call that she received from the young lady re-verifying the wiring had taken place or had been set up, that should have um, put up a, um, some type of alarm for her to check into it a little bit more. And it, initially it doesn't seem like it was handled a proper, uh, the proper way, which it ended up costing her way more than the 30,000 that so she had to pay for an attorney and all this other things. Mm -hmm. Did you guys take a guess at how much, what that consequence was, how much it cost her? We didn't actually get come up with a number. We just, cause we don't, there's no telling what eight months of an attorney will cost you. So I'm pretty sure the attorney cost them more than 30,000. So maybe 60, $70,000 possibly. How yeah, much did it, it cost her? It was, it was upwards of a hundred thousand dollars, right? Because she had to pay, she had already, so the, so the invoice that she paid, that money was gone by the time she figured out that, that the uh, breach had happened. But she still had to pay the contractor, so she had to pay that twice, and then she had to pay the attorney fees and, and all of that. So it was a painful lesson. And so she, now let me ask you this question. Um, I don't want to take up everybody's time, but uh, let me ask you this question. So, because we were in our group, I know we had two out of the three that were saying that we probably would not tell. Well, the, well, the two of us said we would tell the government that we had a mistake. The other person was like, we would not tell the government if we had a mistake. But I was saying, I would tell, cause I know when we do contracts and you have to, uh, you get those when you're sub, contractors they want to know if the prime is paying you on time so they send out questions and they ask you so i'm like so if they tell them hey hey you've been paid on time and you say no i think it will present a problem if they don't already know about it so what do you actually do in that situation would you or would you not tell yeah so from a cyber standpoint you may be contractually required to tell so for for nist 800 171 you're contractually required to tell them that that happened Right, when there's been an incident, you have to. So it goes back to making sure that you know your responsibilities. So if you see those FAR clauses in your contract, you'll wanna make sure that you actually read them, right? So, so you'll see the name of the FAR clause, but there's language that goes in there. So just make sure you understand what that language is. Uh, so in this instance, she really didn't need to tell them. I mean, she had to call the FBI, right? To try and track down the money. 
so they needed to know that that problem was happening because if it was if it was going on with her money it may have been getting back to you know she was receiving electronic payments from the government or some other things and again when it comes to subcontract requirements you uh, very often have a clause in your contract that tells you when you have to pay your subcontractors and on those big acquisition vehicles like we talked about i talked about um eight a stars or Alliance and those kind of big contract vehicles, there are provisions in there about how well you treat your, your subcontractors and how well you're paying them. Well, thank you for that feedback. Any other, um, so what was that third question in there? That third question in there was, uh, we talked about consequences and uh, someone put in the chat, not just the financial, but the indirect, right? Her reputation. And within the group that I was in and Sandra uh, said she couldn't unmute for right now. Uh, so thank you for letting me know that in the group that we were in, you know, uh, there's really this this question of um, whether or not you tell somebody that you've had a breach like that. But the situational awareness component of CMMC and, and these other cybersecurity requirements is really about sharing information. Because the more that we know, then the more we can all uh, protect our individual systems. So uh, what about that fourth one? Cyber crimes, they generally reveal a weakness in one of three areas. Any thoughts on which of the three areas uh, she had weaknesses. You know, you talked a little bit about them in the beginning. I don't know if, can, can anybody hear? Yeah, we can yes, hear you. Yes, we can hear oh, you. Okay. Everybody's off. So this is this is Gerald Blackman. I, I can't tell you what group I was in, but with Ms. Gwen and, and Victor. So what okay. we think that on, on number four is, is basically a failure at every level. From, from the technical standpoint, operational and management. Um, just as uh, uh, Leticia said earlier, you know, she should not have made those decisions at that point. There should be some breaks and some check marks prior to her going out and doing that from a managerial standpoint. And why does the email just get directly to her in that aspect? You know, is it a CFO? Is it somebody within finance that that needs to go to that uh, handles that type stuff? And then um, from a technical standpoint, you know, when I, I, I'm an IT guy um, and situational awareness, you, you know, you always have to have that training in place to say, hey, guys, look, there'll be things coming in like phishing or, you know, some suspicious emails before you open them check email addresses, ensure that you're going to the right people or they're coming from the right places. So um, we felt that it was kind of like a, um, well, not kind of, but it was a failure on all, at all levels. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly right. And so, uh, so let's think the context of CMMC, right? Now you can see why the government would look at more increasing levels of cybersecurity uh, hygiene that they want in place the more uh, responsibility that you have with respect to the data, right? So um, uh, it, all of that becomes important in understanding. It's not just enough to say, oh, we have this best practice in place. It's gotta be documented. People have to be trained. They have to know that I've gotta consistently follow this process all the time. And that's what determines maturity, right? I can have documentation every day of the week. If I never read it and nobody ever follows the documentation, then I don't really have a mature organization that's following that process. And so you'll see those are going to be key as you uh, think about what you need to do from a CMMC standpoint. So thank you for providing that uh, response as well. So then what about the uh, CMMC domains? What do you guys think about which of them might have been applicable in this instance? Hi, this is uh, Cheryl from, I believe I was with group three. And thank you, Cheryl. hi, so we were saying, um, configuration management, awareness and training, identification and authentication, incident response, security assessment, and system and integration integrity. And I wanted to add that um, I'm also in IT and with the system integrity, if that was put in place and you know there was a misspelling in the email, especially because in the company's part of the email, the ABC partners, it was a C instead of an E. If you had a system and in, uh, email integrity system in place, it would have picked that up and it wouldn't, it wouldn't have went through. It would have been considered um, spam or phishing email, but 
um, you know, a pop up window would, would um, not push this email through. And so, um, uh, so I agree with, with the system and in, um, integration integrity. Mm -hmm. Yep. So across the board, there were just a number of different things that, uh, that countermeasures that could have put it, been put into place uh, to ensure that that didn't happen. And the most basic one was just to stop, right? As small business owners, and I too, I'm a small business owner, you know, sometimes you can just get so busy uh, in the day-to-day -day work, responding to customers, especially during this pandemic, having to deal with stuff. I'm really fortunate today. My daughter is a guardsman. I am caring for her dog while she's serving. Every single time I get on the Zoom call, he starts barking and playing with his toys and bouncing all around, right? So you can, you can get distracted as you're trying to do your day-to-day -day work, especially with these, right? Love this, but this can be, um, this can be a problem as well because you may just click on an email trying to quickly respond to something without thinking. And then, um, you know, and talking to her, it didn't even dawn on her. It just, she didn't even realize that she, you know, once it was done, then all of a sudden she was like, oh man, I shouldn't have done this and I shouldn't have done that. But at the time it was just, you know, the day-to-day, -day, my partner needs to be paid. We've got a great relationship with them. Let me make sure that I pay them without really thinking about uh, the maturity of the processes that she needed to have in place that might have helped her to avoid that scenario. So you can see just from this uh, this case study, and I could go on and on with case studies of business owners that have just, the amount of money that these hackers are getting is unbelievable. Uh, this was a relatively small one and it happened pretty quickly, but the, the funds were untraceable. The FBI, the bank, the bank said, it's not our fault because you authorized the wire transfer. And the FBI said, well, they closed the account the second that the wire went through, so there was nothing that we could do. I mean, it was just the lost cause, and she had to figure out how to pay the contractor and cover all of the costs. Because, of course, when you read that at first glance, you think that it's the contract, the, the uh, partner's fault, right? And the partner pushed back and was like, we didn't have a problem on our systems. You all had a problem on your side. Like, our email hasn't changed. You didn't recognize that that wasn't my email. So it ended up being, uh, you know, several months of just uh, nightmarish experience. Uh, so I hope that that uh, case study helped you to get a, a sense of how CMNC will apply to the things that you do and how important it is, right? So I can talk about control objectives and I can talk about security all the time, but if you can't make the correlation between what that looks like on a day-to-day -day business, on a day-to-day -day basis in your business, then it might not be helpful. So I've got about five more minutes to talk to you. I'm going to uh, open it up for questions and I'm going to let the team there decide how you guys want to handle that. If you want them to put their questions in the chat or if you want to leave their uh, audio open and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have about CMNC or we can talk about that case study some more about uh, what might come next. Well, Andrew, this is Jesse. I have one easy question for you. Mm -hmm. um, fishing incident. Was it a random fishing meaning that it was like some guy from Africa somewhere that just sent out a phishing email because he figured out, somehow figured out, well, no, it had to be from Africa, but somebody had figured out who the person was that was responsible for that function and sent them a phishing email. How did they, how did they target her is what I'm asking. So um, that, that one slide that I told you about criminals targeting the unprepared and those breach reports, they are, the adversaries are actively every single day trying to breach your system. So she just caught, got caught in one of the more common breaches that you see occur today, which is called CEO fraud. Uh, hackers target CEOs. And so emails of that nature uh, you find them in breaches, right? So, so a, um, an Equifax breach, for instance, they may not have gotten anyone's credit information, but they may have gotten a whole bunch of email addresses, or um, they may have your address and not have your phone number. So they, they kind of uh, combine this data, and then they just kind of uh, send out um, trial balloons, for instance, and someone will click on that and they are successful and then they just move on to the next one. So they're uh, probably the last two to three years, uh, in particular in business circles, there have been these emails that go around that either go to the owner or they go to the finance person, right? So the CFO, the controller, one of them that have something to do with these invoices. As a matter of fact, some of the folks that were in our group, they had had that exact same thing, almost exact dollar figure that happened to them as well. So it's just them, you know, just, they're just 
uh, throwing out a wide net and seeing who they who they can catch. And and the other challenge is the human eye. We have the ability, and so if you've ever seen it, these little puzzles, or you might have seen it on on social media, our uh, brain has the ability to complete a sentence whether the words are spelled correctly or not. And so what happens is you, if you're rushing, you look at that, you don't even see that transposition of those letters, the fact that that's not really an E and it was, it was something else. And so you don't catch it until some time later. And they know that. Okay, Ms. Madison, are there any questions uh, in, the, in the question box? There's one question, um, Angela, they are wondering if your slides will be available after the presentation. Yeah, Tommy sent me an email, so we'll see what we can do to get you guys slides. And that was the only question in the question box at this time. Okay, well, um, this is still the time that is, we know that uh, your time is valuable, but I thought this has been a great session. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, you can raise your hand and, and unmute your, your mic and ask that question for the benefit of everybody that uh, is on the screen. I see a comment from Victor. It's easy to identify CEOs through public information, websites and company registrations, yes. And of course, people buy those lists, right? They'll go and buy our information. So, so when a when a uh, data breach happens at like a Marriott, for instance, they're just gathering all the information. They don't even know what to do with it yet. They sell it on the market, and then the hackers figure out ways to use the data that you have, right? So if they steal your credit card, um, they they may not have the whole credit card number. They may have uh, some of the digits and not all. And so they're just running these software programs to try to see if they can um, get some money associated with them. Okay, I think there's one in there, Angela, seems like for me, uh, and I, I, I won't pronounce the name because I will butcher it, but uh, uh, the question oh, is, I see. Yeah. the question oh, is, I what is the best way to connect with the folks on this call in the same business space and opportunities? Um, well, if you registered properly, right? Because I had a whole, I had about 18 Jacob Browns on, on the screen. Jake, the only one I know is a guy that works for me. And then we changed the names to, to guess one through 20. Uh, so if you properly register and we have your email address, then what will happen is we will send, uh, there's information we're gonna send out after this and you'll have each other's email addresses. But if you didn't, and uh, then uh, you'll be Jacob Brown. And so if you, <laughs> so you gotta make sure you register properly using you know, your, your information, okay? All right, we got about four minutes left. I do have one other, I'm not trying to poll you to death, but to piggyback off of Angela's first poll, where she asked about DOD, we did have questions through, some questions throughout about other federal agencies. So I just like to, uh, Jacob, you uh, you put that poll up. Uh, 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 you know, DOD, as she explained, these are the key folks in DOD, but you know, you got the fourth estate folks, you know, besides DIS and DIA, you got DLA, and you might have a contract with one of those folks. That's all part of the DOD family. Uh, that's better mm -hmm. known as the fourth estate. And then the federal agencies, there are about 20 plus of those guys but these are just some of the key ones. And you may have had a contract with one of those federal agencies, DHS, Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, uh, GSA or Treasury. And now if you got a contract with IRS, then you're part of, that's part of Treasury. Uh, you know, not trying to uh, insult anybody, but you know, when you start dealing with these federal agencies, a lot of times you don't even think about the, most of us think about the headquarters guy. Well, you know, HHS has about 10 buy-in divisions that have their own budgets. You know, uh, the Social Security, old guy like me, Social Security Administration, uh, the uh, Center for Medicare Care and Medicaid, you know, those are all key, key uh, agencies. And so if you just take a shot at that, um, I'd like to see that. Of course, we're the Federal Procurement Center out of the 34 business centers for MBDA. And our sole mission is to work in the federal space and help companies that believe they're interested in that. 
in order to try to navigate, obtain contracts, get to know, uh, uh, try to open doors with the, uh, the key people. And um, so our doors are open uh, and you can uh, reach out and, and uh, talk to us if you're not a part of what we do. So see, that's a, uh, there you go. That's pretty interesting. Uh, there were a number of folks on here that got federal contracts. Now, as she said, the DOD is always first in the, you know, that big elephant in the room, but uh, you can already see GSA, I believe, and one other agency has already put this requirement in there so the others will follow. Uh, Congress just, had, they're pushing, you know, the big elephant in the room first, uh, but pretty much when it comes to that stuff, the rest of the folks are gonna follow suit, okay? So what's next? Uh, workshop number two is on the 17th of February. Uh, Ms. Angela will come back and she will grace us and we'll talk about how do you prepare for CM CMMC. And uh, we're trying to keep a cohort of family members together. Um, so you registered, uh, as soon as this is over, there'll be a new flyer out for that particular registration. So uh, that's why it's so important for your email address to, have been in the registration box uh, the right way and you will get that personally uh, before we put it out to the public. Okay, that's how special you are. First up in the window. Okay, uh, I'll pause um, and for save the date, if you will, March the 3rd is number three and then March the 17th is the final one. And we'll send that out also in the email, and it'll be posted on our website at www.mbdafpc.com. Okay, I'll pause to see if anybody's got any questions or comments. And uh, we thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we couldn't be a success without you being a part of it. And um, we look forward to you coming back on the 17th. Angela, any uh, final words? It's been a pleasure spending the afternoon with you. I know we've had at least one person that's out in Hawaii, so it's not afternoon for you, but it's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you guys in about two weeks. I do have a 3 p.m., so I'm going to have to scoot, but it was great to right. spend time with you. Thank you for your participation and all your questions. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Tommy. It's good seeing you. All right. Take care.